Good afternoon, everyone. I mean, really kudos to all of you for braving the Bombay weather and the Bombay rains to honestly be here. It wasn't easy. It took me one hour, 15 minutes to get here. So yeah, uh, thanks for being with us and uh, thanks for the panel. So uh, yeah, let's kickstart the discussion. So placing better bets with digital media, you know, that was, that was the thought process. And you know, we were all racking our brains together, how to go about it. And it essentially boiled down to, you know, understanding how the digital marketing domain has transformed over the last five years, how it has evolved. And, uh, you know, we are here to assess essentially about uh, what is the depth and the pace of how digital marketing has grown. So I have a very, very esteemed panel here. I mean, if we were having this discussion five years ago, where, I mean, why digital marketing was strong, but growing and evolving versus right now, it's a huge difference, and uh, I think uh, it has impacted most Abraham's business. So, you know, the pre-COVID, the post-COVID digital marketing era. So, I'd like Abraham to kickstart his thoughts. How do you think that, you know, digital marketing has transformed and evolved over the last five years? What's like your take, especially pre-COVID, post-COVID? How do you see the things going now? Thanks, Raghav. That's a motherhood question, so I'll attempt a brief answer. As probably the oldest marketer on this panel, representing the oldest brand for sure, uh, I, we re I represent Thomas Cook, which has been in business for 145 years in India. So, no question that we are the oldest. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think uh, for a long while now, everybody's talked about digital as sort of breathing down the neck of traditional media. I think that phase uh, went by in a whoosh, especially after the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic accelerated the whole digital revolution. And in any any case, India was leapfrogging over a lot of the typical evolutionary cycles of the develop, developed world. Uh, I think uh, my mandate when I came into Thomas Cook about 12 years ago was to really try to uh, bridge the traditional to digital uh, domain from a marketing standpoint. Because typically the brand used to appeal to older uh, customers, so more package stores and that kind of stuff. And we were going into a individual traveler, more experiential kind of environment in obviously the youngest demography in the world and the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, what we've done, and I probably am unique in that, we do a bit of both. Uh, today, actually, we're probably poised equally between traditional and digital. Uh, and uh, a lot of what we're doing has, you know, has really moved from about 100% traditional uh, as recently as five, six years ago to, uh, you know, from a impact point of view, probably being about 70, 30, 70 digital. And, and that's really coming from the fact that, especially post pandemic, we've seen a big growth in individual customers versus group customers. And uh, also the average age of our customer has actually come down by 10 years, which I think is a telling testimony to what we wanted to do and digital's ability to do that. Uh, Today, I think nobody colors digital with just one single brush. There's so many layers to it. Uh, I think we are at danger of sort of categorizing digital as one uh, universal thing. Uh, and I think that's really the complexity of it, but I don't want to take everybody's time, so we'll talk about that. So, Shibu, Satish, Vivek, I mean, you guys have seen mm -hmm. hundreds and thousands of brands, you know, make that journey and make that transition, you know. Love to hear your take on it. So, uh, you know, I'll just... Uh, just go slightly behind. If you look at the entire digital population in India, right, it still stands at about 45%. So when I put a lens to that and, and see the opportunity, I still feel that we still have a 55% opportunity lying in India. And that's what we are experiencing in the last few years. COVID had its own curse and a bliss, uh, while we all saw and experienced the curse of it. The other side of the story was it actually gave uh, birth to a lot of platforms, which typically might or would have actually grown slower. For example, you know how fast the entire uh, audio or apps like Spotify, Ghana, everything burst, right? How the entire entertainment, the OTT segment actually grew, how uh, gaming sector grew. Traditionally, when we used to look at planning, it used to be Google, Facebook, Programmatic, and some you know top 15 vendors, and then some RTB audience while cohort. Now, Post-COVID, that entire audience segment has changed. Now we know that you know, right from a 13-year-old to a 25-year-old to a 55 to 60-year-old as well, there is some digital asset which is 
which has been accessed probably in the last about three years, where there is an opportunity for a marketeer to go and trap the audience, or probably not trap the wrong word, to you know at least cater to the audience and serve in the relevant ads. That is the kind of shift that we are seeing of how planning has changed from a four segment to a 25 segment, uh, with the birth of new platforms, with audience really engaging, the, the time spent on mobile devices and smart TVs, connected TVs are actually increased. So, and, and I feel that we are still 55% away from where we should be, that, that's how we, I see it. Yeah, I think uh, pretty much summed up by Shibu and Ram, but uh, I, would, I would just add that when you see a cement brand running ads on digital, you know, it kind of tells you where the word has uh, come. From uh, single digit percentages that we used to track when I was at Comely, uh, to then getting into 20 and 30% to finally crossing the 50%, and interestingly, 2019 was the first year globally when digital was larger than non-digital. And that point has just come in India just three years later means that there has been a substantial acceleration that we've seen in India too. Um, coming to planning, I mean, we kind of see that on digital planning has also become much more dynamic as opposed to a plan that's cast in stone. And like Shibu, you were saying, I mean, going down to hundreds of micro cohorts that you are able to track and tune and change the communication and the frequencies of the communication, depending on what stage of the funnel the audience is. I think it finally feels like digital branding is mainstream, digital media is mainstream, and uh, we are seeing advertisers adopting it across verticals. We are seeing offline agencies finally opening up, you know, the, the, the ones that were really the laggards, finally having their digital presence partnering and, and first of all building their own digital presence, the Bikajis of the world getting stronger on digital. I think these are exciting times. I actually have a slightly uh, <coughs> tangential take on this whole thing, right? Which is, who is not digital? And uh, I don't think di making digital uh, or celebrating digital the way we are celebrating is doing justice to how well permeated it is in the fabric of society today, right? And I think post pandemic, the, the major shift that I've seen across brands and, uh, and I'm very new to this space, right? I mean, uh, I've worked in a large agency network for 12 years and I'm a very late entrant to this uh, elite group of founders. Uh, and I'm only, I'm, I'm probably the only non-founder here, but <laughs> a late entrant nonetheless. But I've seen that across the spectrum that now it's all about understanding how at each stage of the brand consumer interaction uh, we can have an intervention, right? Uh, it's no longer about I'm going to first show an ad on TV, build some awareness and then expect them to act on digital, so on and so forth. I think we've been talking about complex journeys for a very long time. I think the journeys are really simple. The idea is that do you know your consumer? If you know your consumer, do you know where they are? And if you know where they are, are you there with the right message at the right time? As simple as that, right? So one thing that has changed post pandemic and uh, Abraham and I were talking about this earlier this morning is that a lot of uh, organizations that were not data aware or were not data sensitive have started to become that, right? I think uh, <coughs> the role of CMOs has changed. Uh, you, we, we see new designations like chief growth officer and not just new designation, new responsibilities, right? where CMOs are not just responsible for how the brand is seen or placed or priced, but also the growth of the business um, uh, and penetration and expansion and so on and so forth, right? And that put a greater responsibilities on agencies as well. That we don't look at digital as just another medium, but a vehicle to drive business and growth for our clients. I think that's the way, that's the biggest shift that has happened. Uh, the importance of digital in that sense has really gotten elevated. Um, of course, uh, MarTech data adoption is, is still at a very nascent stage in India as compared to you know, many other parts of the world. But at least people have started to ask those questions, right? At least us as agencies have started to feel challenged uh, to do more homework, to learn more, to be able to advise our clients better. So that's the biggest shift for me. No, no that's very well put. And you know, coming to your point on you know, uh, marketing officers' growth, uh, 
role evolving, you know, to more of a growth role. You know, how would you rate, because you are interacting with uh, folks every day, the digital maturity of a marketing officer or the marketing teams, you know, if you have to rate it, you know, you see that also has significant, but how open are they to new innovations, you know, in digital, we have things changing left, right and center, you have new innovations, new technologies, new platforms. What is the digital maturity in experimenting that? How, what is the digital maturity in, you know, adopting that? If I can go, yeah. Uh, I think uh, CMOs are in a very tricky spot right now, right? Especially if you look at the way the economy is behaving. Yeah, I mean, India is probably a, a, a light in, in, in a larger canvas of darkness, but that still doesn't mean that the market is not challenging for us. It's very challenging. So even if you had the savviness and the digital maturity, you have to, t every small decision that you take is about how the business is going to grow or sustain, right? Uh, so that's what makes it tricky for a CMO today. Um, the fact that even after two decades of doing digital marketing in India, we still don't have robust end-to-end -end measurement of how digital contributes to everyday <coughs> sales of products getting picked off the shelf or on the website. Um, that's the biggest challenge that a CMO faces, right? A lot of times, that's where the digital savviness and maturity sort of comes into play because there your gut comes into the, comes onto the table rather than all the science, right? If, you've, uh, if you have the in-depth understanding of how digital behaves, if you've done enough experimentation uh, at small scale to see the success, and if you build that robust data set and learning, you are able to make that decision far more confidently. I have a slightly different thought. It is not that the maturity in the market is not there. It's the acceptance of, or probably brand and marketeers to actually invest in that. For example, I'll just give you small, very small examples, right? Things like, uh, uh, you know, tracking fraud, right? Uh, things like programmatic or things like automation. I, I see a reluctance in brands paying the additional cost. They will tell an agency, uh, you guys are charging an agency fee, the tool cost should actually be a part of that. It will not ever make a difference. It will never stack up. We've done that to ourselves. You realize that, right? No, no. I, I <laughs> thought that everybody would be doing some part or the other in their own way. But I, I believe that, you know, uh, that is where the, though the maturity is there, the willingness and the openness to actually invest slightly more into these platforms uh, is very, very critical. Having said that, uh, one big change which is also coming in, even when we talk to CMOs or offline guys, they want to understand digital, they want to learn digital because they understand that at some point in time, only mainline or only being a specific uh, uh, platform level might shun their growth. Uh, digital is soon, or probably anyways is overtaking. So it's important for them to understand how digital is also going to play a complementing role. And, and I, at now when we, I am a part of the network group, so I, I see that it is not a digital war or it is not a you know, mainline war. It is an integrated war, like, like he rightly said, right? What is the user journey? What touch point, what platforms are actually going to be the right mix to use? That is what is going to change. One indicator of that maturity that we see is a few years back, Branding and performance were looked at as two different things in discontinuity. Branding would be largely offline first, and digital would be largely performance. To now, relatively more and more advertise marketeers evolving to accept that it's a continuum, a brand performance continuum, and therefore also the way to look at it as digital as the center stage of the strategy that's driving that brand performance continuum. And somewhere we are, we are using that, or we see that as a measure of that maturity of the market here that we see uh, in front of us. If I can just add to sort of build on a lot of points that all of you have made, I think part of the problem is marketers, uh, the big attraction of digital versus traditional, and as an older marketer we've seen both, uh, has been, or at least in principle was, that there's more data and it's more clean and you understand what you're getting for what you're investing. Unfortunately, and I'm saying this with uh, some level of responsibility here, a lot of the digital ecosystem and providers and agencies and creators like you, unfortunately have not created to marketers like me the kind of transparency or even putting your money where your mouth is uh, from a performance and uh, return on investment point of view. In the traditional world, it was fairly easy for a marketer because there were very few choices. There were big ticket choices. You had the money or you didn't have the money and there were very few avenues to 
put that money in. And the response, if you will, nobody judged you on because it was spray and prayer, right? Today, uh, and the whole principle of digital was, listen, we are giving you accuracy, you are uh, more and more cohorts, you know exactly who you are targeting, the right mind space, uh, you know, the right uh, point in time, the right behavior, and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, to my mind, uh, maybe I'm meeting the wrong people, I yet have not met an agency partner who is able to give you the kind of clarity in terms of this is what you're investing, this is what this plan is doing, and I'm willing to stick my neck out and saying this is the kind of response you're going to get. And I think that's a bit sad because I think the whole theory of digital fundamentally was that you knew what you were getting, it was not going to be spray and pray, it was going to be the right kind of customer, the right kind of mindset, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you, you, your conversions, et cetera, would be a lot more accurate in measurement. And today the expectation, because of the data-driven marketing environment, is really that your CEOs and uh, board expects that level of investment and accuracy in terms of reporting what you're getting. And I, I'm sorry, I'm still saying that we still don't have that level of uh, responsibility and clarity. I'm not doing a marketing pitch, but, uh, uh, you know, when, when you look at digital and performance, the challenge is how are you also tracking the, or how are you also doing the measurement? While a lot of platforms could be end of the funnel, uh, that, that this is also one traditional challenge that, you know, when brands look at conversion, they look at the last click model. Whereas you would be running your campaigns on about five different platforms, and there could be an assisted conversion that is leading to your direct or your organic. Where brands should ideally do is understand where are we spending, what is the attribution which is coming on each of them, and look at a, like we typically try and explain the concept of a e-business ROAS instead of a platform level ROAS. While the platform level ROAS can go up and down, traditionally what you have to look at is how is, so basically we have like, we have a planning principle of say about a 60, 30, 20, and 10, where 60 would be performance, about 20 would be always on kind of a, it could be brand, it could be performance, or it could be high SOV campaigns. Then there is a 10% which is pure, pure, campaigns that are ex very experimental. So the last 10% is absolutely something new, which actually gives probably a opportunity for the brand and the agency to try out ex at least an experimental platform and see what is the impact of this. Again, all in all, what I, where I'm coming to is measurement and attribution has to be looked at. That is when, you know, you'll be able to make sense of the whole marketing spend that you are doing. Uh, again, not an pitch, but, uh, you know, Happy to look at it. Yeah, I mean, there's no simple answer to that. Um, exactly what Shibu said, right? And uh, I've personally worked with brands of all scales, from startups, from e-commerce to uh, the Unilevers and PNGs of the world, right? The debate is this constant Abram, right? And <coughs> the fact that I started my journey 20 years ago, I've seen the sort of the nascent digital era as well. And I've been fortunate to work with a lot of, you know, uh, big brands, <coughs> in the traditional space as well. What brands used to do by default is pay a lot of attention to product pricing placement and looked at media purely from a media lens at one point of time, right? Now when digital came, we said, oh yeah, all touch points available, everything is measurable, everything is cheaper, all of that. That's where we started killing it, sort of, if you stay with me for a bit, <laughs> right? That's why we started killing it, because we never talked about measurement at all, right? Uh, we don't have the Nielsen's of the world tracking sales, for example. Yeah, that's part of what I'm referring to. I'm saying the ecosystem Correct. has to develop a way to credibly measure yeah. value for money invested and put a credible bel bet. Absolutely. And as a provider, service provider, be willing to put your money in where money Absolutely. Is. This, you know, 50 here, 20 here, 30 here, and I think you'll get this. Yeah. That's where you traditional media planning was. Yeah. I'm sorry, meaning I'm uh, I'm outnumbered here. I'm, I recognize that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm saying it I'm therefore yeah. with, a, you know, with uh, some some level of responsibility, like I said. For sure. It's so good to have this uh, yeah. back and forth. It's I think it's yeah, important. Debate's definitely more interesting. Yeah. So there's a second economy. part to it, right, which is the moment we started shifting to a digital ecosystem, the responsibility on the brand side also multiplied, which is, is my website functioning correctly? Do I have the entire analytics in place to ensure that I'm able to optimize the entire user journey. And therefore, to Shibu's point, am I able to actually measure attribution accurately, right? 
Now all of that is an added investment, but which used to happen, like I said, by default side, right? Saying how is my retail placement is going to be? How am I going to do all of that? That used to be a task that the brands took upon themselves. Now it's just about largely, I'm not like brushing the entire industry with one, one brush stroke, but it's largely about, oh, I've got a nice functional website um, and that's good enough. Why aren't you able to generate leads for me, right? But I mean, there are a lot of cases like that, but I think there's a lot of time and resource investment that's required to ensure that that measurement is effective. That's one part of it. The second is yes, I completely agree with you that there are the largest digital platforms today, uh, till today, have not taken steps to make data and measurement available transparently. And that's a common challenge that agencies and clients both face. What's the global challenge? Yeah. I, I think the problem is there's still a effort to sell a plan rather than sell the result. I'm saying finally, what is the marketer looking for? The marketer is saying, hey, listen, I've got X resource and I want Y result, right? Finally, you want a partner who is saying, hey, listen, I'll help you achieve Y result. And I'll tell you the way to do it, and I'm willing to give you a certain amount of confidence by sticking my neck out with you, right? Because there's no question the CMO's neck is on the block, right? And because that's what the CEO or MD is going to do. But you, uh, you still don't have that level of resonance or confidence or accuracy or measurement uh, for that kind of decision making. And I think that's really where a partnership opportunity lies in the ability to be able to, uh, you know, present the data in a convincing way, uh, fix the attribution. Because typically what happens is any agency or partner that comes in will say everything that the previous partner did was wrong. The first three months are going to be about fixing that, right? But that's, you know, that's one quarter of results. Uh, you can't afford that. No, fairly. So, Sadish, please. Yeah, I think, I think, um, the challenge is definitely there. I mean, I think the challenge is for real. But I think it's also a function of how open the marketer is to investing in certain experiments, to try out those experiments, and then say that looks like this thing is working before I scale it up. Sometimes we see that, I mean, th there is definitely a segment of marketers that are much more open, much more experimental, to give it a test first, and then say that, yeah, looks like this is working versus not working and also investing in the measurement and modeling around it. Um, and so we see that the methodologies exist, whether it's about measuring incrementality as opposed to last touch attribution, which I think is the bane of the industry. Last touch has really killed, you know, for a long period of time, the real impact that's coming through. And uh, so marketers who are much more open are looking at alternative methodologies around incrementality, matched market testing, looking at a more holistic way of attribution, and sometimes just testing it out in a few test markets first. And then we have seen such marketers then seeing the benefits of it and actually becoming the ones who are endorsing the investments in digital, even if it was not necessarily entirely measurable in the traditional context of last touch. No, no, I think that's very fair. I think two, three points coming out from the discussion very clearly. Obviously, there's no single universal tracking platform that can work across the board. I think a lot of people are working on it, still preliminary results, some small test trial, but yeah, I don't think, I think we're very far away from that dream stage across web, desktop, app, everything. And we might we be going further away from it because of the post IDFA world. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Google and Facebook, Meta have their own thoughts to it. So uh, really, I, I don't see it happening in the immediate future. And uh, second is that on the digital maturity point is that yes, people are getting mature in terms of they understand it digital, they want to spend on digital and coming to your point Vivek, that investment in analytics, if that's not supported, that investment in tracking, that investment in optimization, if that's not supported, definitely it'll be a challenge. But if to your point, uh, I think fairly put, I mean, and obviously bearing part of the responsibility as part of the group that uh, definitely need to stick our necks more out. So definitely we're there. I think it's almost there. And uh, we co-own a lot of results. We co-own a lot of things. But yeah, definitely, I think more needs to be done if uh, folks are still uh, not fully convinced. Fairly, I uh, understand that. So just uh, moving on from here. So definitely there's traditional uh, th on which uh, investment is going. So take Thomas Cook's example, 70, 30. You know, you're still doing offline. You're still doing online. But how are you convincing the advertisers or how are you as an advertiser convinced that 
I am able to follow the user offline to online or online to offline. How are you bridging that journey that all my spends or all my planning or all my bets that I'm going to place are actually in correlation? And it's not like two independent plans working together. Actually, in the last few years, we've actually um, taken the journey from some digital to digital first to only digital. So today, most of our large campaigns are only digital. They're being planned digital from inception. Um, so, and, and, and that's a good thing. And like I said, I just wish uh, there was a lot more clarity in terms of how to plan those campaigns because today a lot of it's still being taken on the basis of some data and some gut, right? Uh, it's not that marketers aren't used to using their gut. I, I, we, we've been doing it for years and stuff like that, but you sort of expect, and the boardroom expects as well, that when you present a marketing plan today, you're saying digital plan, it's going to have that level of accuracy, right? So that's one point, point I, I won't belabor it because I made that point. I think the other parts also, today you're seeing a growing, and I was just on a panel a few days ago on connected TV and, uh, and it, could that be the next big thing? I think theoretically it could be, especially for a category like ours, because co-viewing is critical for the purchase of our category. Uh, family viewing uh, definitely uh, behaviorally increases the opportunity of sale. Uh, of course, large screen, you know, good audio, et cetera, helps sell the travel experience as well. Uh, but unfortunately, the result uh, in terms of response, we still don't have that, you know, that bridge of how do you get a response rate from connected TV. So I think uh, in every digital subset of digital media, I think there is an opportunity to sort of straddle the one weakness that that, that aspect has. And I'm just using connected TV as an example. Uh, great advantages, big screen, big audio, co-viewing, et cetera, uh, and, and that, that uh, ownership is growing. And from a high value category like ours, that's the only audience I'm interested in. But uh, you know, there's still the technology slash content gap of capturing response and getting, uh, being able to measure it. So I think what would be useful for this audience is to really think about each of these aspects of digital media and marketing and what's that one weakness that as a marketer, uh, you know, people like us are facing that you can address. Because if you can come to me with a solution like that, I'd, I'd be with you, right? I, I'd invest with you. So I think that's one sort of need. So um, um, I see it in three uh, on three tracks, but before that, so there is a online jewelry brand that sells 90% offline, and online is primarily like a showroom, and 10% sales happen through online. But they uh, have been a always on player, investing in the entire full funnel paradigm and measuring and seeing those results. And we see it in three, uh, you know, there are three things I, would, I want to add here. Number one, for brands that are offline as well, so long as there is certain online touch point that they have, one way is to look at and do the audience analysis, audience intelligence, without necessarily having to buy media. That's one of the powers that technology offers today, where you can do audience discovery, understand who your audiences really are, so long as you have some digital touch points of that audience. It could even be their offline data, phone number, email IDs as well, or it could be the digital touch points that you may have. That's the audience discovery bit. And that then influence the media planning that you would be doing or media buying that you would be doing. The second part is uh, when one is actually running media investments and running campaigns, looking at those at a very granular cohort level to understand which cohorts are really responding how to which campaign and at what stage of the funnel. And all of that today is uh, achievable online by not looking at that one media plan in monolith, but breaking it down into hundreds and thousands of possibilities. Number three is the measurement part, which is, which the way we see it is at, at like four different sections in terms of the brand lift that you see, in terms of how that translates into the search lift for the brand, both in relative and absolute terms how it translated to the traffic that came to the uh, website or audio digital touch points you had and measuring the quality of that. And finally, looking at how that translated into the overall conversion lift, even if your entire conversion was offline, irrespective of that. So I would say that these three uh, prongs have become the cornerstone of how we are seeing market is adopting on digital. I'd just like to add a few points rather than starting a parallel track. 
uh, being a part of the network company now, we we I definitely see a change. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. <laughs> we n now we are also seeing that you know like like how Sudesh started right of how the audience planning happens. Now the audience planning is not thought from a digital or from a traditional media. It is looked up as audience as a whole and their patterns, their behaviors, well, it could be on digital or it could be on mainland as well. That is how I think brand should approach it right now. Now, since we are an integrated agency, we look at that holistically now. You know, this is the audience, this is the persona, this is what they would be doing on a TV, this is what they would be doing on a digital, this is what they would be doing probably on a connected TV. That's how the audience discovery happens. And again, when you come to the planning, there are brands which are like digital first, there are brands which is 70-30, uh, 60-40, and then there are brands which are also 90-10. How do you measure each of them? We are, we are working on a brand, something similar to what you, you just mentioned, where the sales primarily happens offline because there is always a touch and feel to it. There the measurement is completely different. We actually look at a footfall there. There, there are platforms where it actually helps you measure online to offline. And there are integrated ways to also do it, right? You put on a coupon code, you do a QR code, you just track that audience and it's all about building that measurability of how are you able to connect all the channels together and then how are you look at, looking at the efficacy. That is how I would be also looking at how uh, or probably traditional brands are also looking at digital and how digital plus integrated or probably digital plus traditional outcomes can be looked at. Yeah, completely echo that uh, Shivu. In fact, CX or customer experience is the core of our framework as well, right? And online to offline to online or offline to online to offline are happening all the time, right? At a very fundamental level, I think the discoverability of the brand has to be ensured before you start spending money on media and start expecting results, right? Like which the point that I made earlier as well, right? I mean, I've got a storefront, but am I discoverable in the right way across platforms as well? Am I out there with the right message? Am I uh, when I'm communicating a certain ad on TV, is are all of my other touch points uh, coherent or am I incoherent? Because the moment that happens, whether it is somebody watching an ad on television and they happen to go onto your website and they, they can't connect with what they saw there and what they see on the website. And they walk into the store and they have, they have a completely different experience. Every experience is broken. I mean, there are measurement solutions that are everywhere, uh, but I think a CMO's challenge is that they're all uh, distinct data sets, right? They're not a common data set, which tells you that the same person who watched the TV is the same person who's responding on digital and so on and so forth. There are a lot of indirect correlations happening, but in the absence of nothing, there is something. But all of those measures and solutions are in place. Uh, I'm not gonna make a pitch here, but there is <coughs> a product coming up very soon, which is very different from audio print, fingerprinting, watermarking, et cetera, which will also solve that TV to digital sort of a behavior. Uh, a globally patented product. Uh, we should all be hearing about that very soon. But <coughs> until that happens, let's at least ensure that that small percentage of media investment that needs to go behind measurement, uh, we are all able to do that. And to Satish's point earlier, conduct small experiments. If we, it has never been done for your brand, conduct small experiments, take out 5%, 10%, try it out for a month, two months, sorry, not a month, two months. <laughs> You don't get anything in a month. <laughs> Try it out for two months, establish some data, and then start scaling it up. Fair point. Fair point, Vivek. Yeah, I think we are uh, end, we are starting our last uh, five minutes of discussion, and I and I'm pretty sure the audience also will be very keen in understanding. You know, some uh, some journey is that you have personally guided, and you have been part of that journey. I mean, your company was uh, in business before there was marketing. Forget digital marketing. So, I mean, I really want to understand, you know, uh, from your experiences, some brand stories, you know, where we have guided the traditional, what were the issues, some roadblocks, how did the brands take it, and what do they see it, what was their take when they started, versus what is their take right now? I think the, the, the best case study I can talk about from the category and the brand that I represent is dealing with a two and a half year period called the pandemic. Travel was down to zero, uh, category itself, forget brand. Uh, and you obviously had to keep the brand present, people engaged. Uh, obviously, we had taken money for people to travel when the lockdown happened. So we had to use marketing in a way to build confidence because this was on the heels of 
one of our competitors called Cox and Kings going under. Uh, our, pa our erstwhile parent, Thomas Cook, which we shared a brand name in the UK going bankrupt and so on. So on the heels of that, the pandemic happened. So we had to reassure those customers that we weren't going bankrupt and the money was safe. And keeping them engaged, keeping our partners engaged, our vendors engaged, everybody engaged. It was a very, very different kind of experience for a marketer like me because typically it's about assuming some level of category demand and building brand demand. This was the first time when you had zero uh, category demand, forget brand demand. So I think digital was really crucial in terms of keeping not just employees engaged, customers' uh, confidence up, and being able to bounce back the way we have uh, with the best profits we've had in a decade uh, coming out of the pandemic within a year of the pandemic. So I think, uh, meaning I'm a believer, uh, and yeah, looking forward to doing a lot more. I'll, I'll tell you another case of one of the clients that we work with, we work with Distillery as a brand. And I remember when we started speaking to them in COVID, they had just developed a website. And their idea was to move the, the entire traditionally water buying journey into online. So you would ideally call a retailer and you would ask for a bisleri, right? Uh, they wanted to change that pattern. They wanted to build the subscription model. And we have actually seen and we have lived the journey with them. Uh, while we spoke about <coughs> media, we spoke about audiences, something that we really missed out was also the customer engagement, right? It is not only about acquiring and building your first uh, conversion. It is also about how do you influence the repeat conversions how do you influence people who have come, experienced the product, have probably done an add to cart, but have, they have not converted. So what we also did for them was right from changing or adding inputs to the UX in terms of where the customer is coming, what are the uh, hotspots on the website, where are they clicking, where are they not clicking, how to do the product placement, to actually actively tracking the, uh, the entire journey, uh, running uh, you know uh, modeling campaigns on paid, on acquisition, uh, helping them in the user retention. Uh, there was also, we went a little extra mile to also help them optimize the ERP in terms of, you know, when, if there are say pro probably three trucks which are going out, how do you optimize to make sure that they are delivering best? What are the best routes that they're taking? So when you look at a client and, you know, look at it from a complete 360 degree, uh, you know, while you could be solving some of the problems which is not under your scope, uh, eventually what it will, help you in is to probably help you better in terms of media spends, uh, get better, uh, you know, add your scope uh, additionally. We have seen that transformation happening for them uh, right from where they were about three years back to where they are right now. Uh, uh, they, they, the entire company believes that digital is going to or is going is driving better results every single year. And uh, so, so the, st the story that I would want to end up with is uh, media is audiences, media, great but also look at the, the second segment, which is the cons consumer uh, cohorting from a, a, from a retention perspective, uh, find out channels which will actually convert when you are, there, there is no point in just bombarding them with messages, right? A lot of actually brands do that. There are, there is three point uh, uh, notification that is being sent every time. They don't track how many people are actually opening the, the notification, which platforms and how do we adapt to that? Those are the things that, you know, marketers should also change. So uh, this is a case study about Haladoc, which is Indonesia's largest health tech company today. But uh, sometime in 2021, uh, around May, June, that when we were asked to uh, work with them, prior to that, they had built like a market leadership over a year's time frame. But just around June 21, they were losing that leadership to the number two player, which was a distant number two, but that was now closing in. And there was, of course, the benefit of timing where uh, the marketeers data science team had figured out that an unfortunate COVID Delta wave was going to hit Indonesia 25 days later. So, of course, an unfortunate but great timing from a marketing standpoint. And at that point, in fact, uh, Holodoc was running a TV campaign, and uh, that was not driving Lyft either. Because as a brand, it's still... a uh, a, it, it has its own niche audience, right? It's a health tech app at the end of the day, and you're trying to alter people's behavior to order medicines online, and also pharma consultation and stuff like that. And so TV was paused, it came to digital, it was planned at an extremely granular cohort level to really understand which cohorts are the ones that are likely to change their behavior or that are, that are responding better. And so it's not like planned in advance, it's like everything being dynamic. 
And when the COVID wave did hit Indonesia over those eight weeks, they had a hockey curve growth. Massive growth in the new customer activations, transactions, became the number one app on the App Store ahead of Facebook, WhatsApp, and just about anything else. And if it was COVID alone, even the other competition would have got benefited, which was not the case. And the best part was the sustenance campaign then continued even later at a fractional spend than what was earlier being done. Um, when the third COVID wave hit Indonesia, this brand had a natural peak coming in while the competition was nowhere. And post COVID, all these three waves, the brand has established a steady new baseline completely that's far higher than wherever the competition exists. In fact, the competition is almost like decimated. So this is a very interesting case study of digital planned, executed at a very granular level. Of course, a great timing, but somewhere really beating TV for a brand like Prodoc. I'll actually talk about two, uh, two categories. One from my past experience, which is FMCG brands uh, that are amorphous, impulse-driven, so on and so forth, where you know the whole investment on digital is under question mark perpetually, right? So I'm till, till date, I'm grateful to the marketing leaders who sat in those organizations and had the vision that if my audience is out there, that's where I need to be, and I will start investing in that. It started with a simple, very simple objective of if I have my own first party data, can I drive media more efficiently, right? It, it literally started with something that simple. And yes, multi-touch attribution, analytics, modeling, all of that was done throughout the period consistent efforts for about almost a year to the extent that owning the first party data not only led to uh, 30 to 40 percent efficiency in media but m multiple times growth in their engagement levels the overall correlation to when brand communicated online to when sales uplifted at a retail all of those were established and some of those case studies are available because they won awards in a lot of places Talking about my current agency and the work we're doing with a brand called, uh, a water purifier brand called A.O. Smith, right? Now, again, we've woven the digital touch points across. Now, this is also a category which is heavily trade dependent, right? So there is an entire intervention that happens with trade every time a new product is put out there. Uh, they also have, they're also on the journey of that entire full end-to-end -end integration between retail and e-commerce. So they have the challenge of different SKUs being available in retail and different SKUs being available online, right? So trade has to be educated differently for responding to both. Uh, because people who are exposed to the brand online will look for something else. People who walk in the store will see something else. So all of those aspects of, of the entire customer experience have been woven into it. All those data points collated, analyzed, fed back into the system, uh, fed into media to start optimizing for every aspect of the campaign, whether it's something we're driving for e-commerce, something we're driving towards retail, uh, in fact, on e-commerce, Aosmith, despite being a challenger brand, one of the leading uh, e-com platforms has called it as the best performing brand because of the work we've been able to do with all these data, data points, bringing consumers from outside, counter to what e-com platforms ask you to do, bringing customers from outside the platform to drive conversions on the platform. That's pretty amazing. And uh, thanks for sharing those insights and those examples. I think that was uh, really enriching for me personally also. So guys, yeah, in the interest of time, we are, don't want to delay everyone's lunch. So we'll be wrapping up pretty soon. But uh, just to, in concluding thoughts, I think the evolution from traditional to digital has been just amazing. I've been personally in the industry for the last 10 years. What I used to do 10 years ago, seven years ago, five years ago, three years ago, and today it's very different. I mean, if Charles Darwin was alive, he would have been proud of us how crazily that we have evolved. I mean, that's what I would like to say. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the panel. Thanks a lot for the audience being very patient. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.